Hello friends, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday afternoon, 1 to 1.30 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we'll be discussing how the timeless luster of gold and silver can restrain governments and end war. So this is a, uh, an elaboration of a previous blog post I did entitled, Is Money the Root of All Evil? Referring to Mike Maloney's video by the same name. An oft-repeated but erroneous assertion is money is the root of all evil. How can this be so? Money is simply an inanimate object. How can an inanimate object be blamed for anything? If a civilian man murders someone with a gun, does the gun go to jail? If he murders someone with a chainsaw, does the chainsaw go to jail? Guns, chainsaws, and anything that one person might use to harm another person can all be used for the purposes of good as well as evil. If a computer program malfunctions, do you blame the program or the human programmer? I hope the idiocy of this assertion is apparent. Before free and peaceful people chose money, barter was the trade method of choice. This carried with it inherent problems, which included lack of coincidence of wants, lack of division, lack of common measure of value, and lack of store of value. Money and currency were born out of necessity as communities grew. Money is a tool chosen by free and peaceful people to trade amongst each other. It was chosen because it satisfied certain criteria that facilitated trade. These criteria include portability, divisibility, fungibility, or interchangeability, um, durability, and a store of value. Now, there is a fundamental difference between money and currency. Currency is all those things minus being a store of value. It can be controlled by governments in the form of central banks and legal tender laws. However, this is not necessary. Some examples of currency not controlled by governments include tobacco, exotic bird feathers, colored beads, stamps, candy bars, nails, copper, lumber, axe heads, seashells, salt, sugar, spices, etc. All of these substances satisfied some criteria of money but lacked one or two others and so were eventually abandoned. Eventually, about 5,000 years ago, Precious metals, more specifically gold and silver, began their use by free and peaceful people, although governments have, over the millennia, attempted to control, standardize, and issue its use. These efforts have always failed. Precious metals always retain their intrinsic value and therefore are a wonderful protection against deficit spending, pork barrel spending, warfare, imperialism, and grandiose public works that insane governments frequently try to fund through taxation and debt. The market can only be unnaturally stretched and distorted so far by governments before it snaps back. When this snapback occurs, beware, for it is during this phase that much of the illusory wealth disappears as gold and silver do an accounting for all the excess fiat currency, government bonds, and debt that was created during the distortion. This is known as the boom-bust cycle. This economic mechanism has been in effect in an exaggerated way for as long as governments have sought to meddle and intervene in so-called monetary policy. As long as we allow government through central banks to control and manage our money, we will never be free. It is a rigged game on an uneven playing field. It is playing monopoly with someone who can print unlimited amounts of currency. Far from money being the root of all evil, money is at the root of human trade and therefore plays an integral role in our economic health and vitality. Support the black market. Support the counter economy. Get your wealth out of fiat currency and the CFI banks, which would be systemically important financial institutions. 
The state can be defeated not by violent revolution, but by economic self-sufficiency and by withdrawing support of a decadent and predatory system. Simply remove nourishment from the parasite and it will necessarily shrivel up and die without the application of any force whatsoever. And I end with a quote from The Hidden Secrets of Money, which is Mike Maloney's um, documentary series from episode two. Due to Gresham's law, gold and silver started to disappear from circulation from 431 to 404 BC as people spent the government enforced copper coins and hoarded the gold silver coins. Suddenly it took a whole bunch of copper coins to buy a gold silver coin. This is the first time gold or silver ever had a price. Before that, everything was measured in a weight of gold and silver. So this is one of my favorite topics to discuss. <laughs> this is what I learned first when I uh, first started um, learning about um, uh, libertarianism, Austrian macroeconomics, um, precious metals. It's, uh, it's an amazing topic because the really it, it, learning about monetary history, you understand that it, it forms the foundation of a thriving and prosperous society, right? Because the reflection of a free monetary system, unfettered, unencumbered, without restrictions, without laws, will ensure that the people are prosperous. The money is like, it's like the lifeblood of an economy. That's what we use to trade in, right? And once governments immediately start to control and they start to debase and debauch the currency, that's when you begin to have all of the um, problems that are typically associated with um, uh, capitalism and with, uh, you know, business free enterprise and all that stuff. People get it kind of misunderstood. But the, the truth is that a lot of this, um, a lot of these distortions in the economy are completely unnatural and artificial um, and would not really occur to the exaggerated extent that they do occur uh, if government was not so... Um, if, if it did not take a, a, such an interventionist approach, right, did not meddle so much in so-called, quote, fiscal policy, right, or monetary policy. <laughs> so, um, so let's discuss this. Um, gold and silver started being used in ancient Egypt about 5,000 years ago as trade. It was not necessarily considered money, but it was used in trade. Um, and this is fascinating because people didn't use gold and silver because they were forced to. They used it because they chose to, right? They found that it was an ideal medium for exchange, right? Because as, as, as I stated, barter has many deficiencies associated with it. Barter is good, um, but when, you, when society begins to, uh, when communities begin to you know, aggregate and, and, and um, people settle down in large groups of uh, l large communities, um, barter is not sufficient and frequently um, produces um, unbalance. So, so having um, a commonly regarded medium of exchange that everybody values, such as gold and silver, um, is very useful. Everybody wants gold and silver. Even today, you know, you you, know, you can say that the um, that um, our you know governments are trying to uh, <laughs> institute a world currency, right? One world currency. Well, that's what gold and silver was. <laughs> it was one world currency. You, even today, you go anywhere on the planet, basically, and you ask them, do you accept, you know, do you value gold and silver, right? They, they don't really accept it as money because it has been money, hasn't been money since, uh, uh, since basically 1933 when FDR um, um, removed it, uh, removed gold, and then 1964 when... Uh, I believe it was Lyndon Johnson uh, removed silver from, from the coinage in the United States. But, um, but yeah, anywhere in the world you go, gold and silver are recognized as having intrinsic value, right? Intrinsic value. Now, now what, is this, what does this mean, intrinsic value, right? Because 
because before um, human beings uh, populated the earth, right, there was gold and silver. However, it wasn't really being used for anything. Same thing goes for oil, right, and all you know, natural resources that we use. They weren't really being used for anything. So you can say they had no value until human beings came along and uh, discovered uh, these natural resources and began to use them for their intrinsic value, right? You know, you can say, you know, we, you know, peak oil and, you know, this, uh, you know, oil is harmful to the, you know, to the earth and everything, the atmosphere. But um, the truth is, you know, something like oil or anything, you know, any natural resource that's being used up, um, it's, it really has no value until humans come along to use it, right? So the same thing goes with gold and silver, right? It had no value in the Earth's, Earth's crust until human beings discovered it and um, discovered its value in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of um, the difference between uh, money and currency, right? Um, so, so as I said before, currency would be something that's, um, it's divisible, it's fungible, which means a dollar in my pocket equals is the same as a dollar in your pocket buys the same right um, it's portable you can take it anywhere it's durable right it's it withstands time okay so those four things are the characteristics of money or sorry currency currency is uh, um, something that um, <clears throat> It does not necessarily have to be government mandated, such as, um, you know, uh, paper bills. You know, it could be those other, um, those other th uh, units of exchange that people have uh, commonly agreed on, like, you know, seashells and, um, you know, and um, tobacco, salt, sugar, spices, you know, that people agree to exchange. But they all have their problem, you know, when it comes to these definitions of currency. And then you have money, which is the next level up. And, and that would be um, precious metals because they are necessarily a store of value, right? They increase in value with time. Therefore, the incentive is for people to save them, right? Not to spend them. People, you know, uh, when we're in a society like we are today of, uh, you know, rampant deficit spending, pork barrel spending, warfare as a result, you know, paid for by fiat currency creation and debt, um, when you're in that kind of environment, you can, you can, um, expect the currency to be rapidly depreciating. And that's what we've seen rapid depreciation ever since, uh, 1971, which is, uh, a key year because that's when, uh, president Nixon, um, <clears throat> famously took off, he, uh, the gold, uh, link to the dollar, right? So at that time it was, the Bretton Woods system, which linked um, the U.S. dollar to gold at thirty-five dollars per ounce, right? Um, so once he took that off in 1971, every nation on the planet immediately became um, they became holders of fiat currency, right? Because it was all currencies were linked to the dollar, and the dollar was linked to gold. So so immediately it all became fiat currency. And then you have the rampant inflation of the 70s, um, you know, in double digits. And, um, and, then, and that's when you had the first uh, bull market of the precious metals, gold and silver. The, the first peak, uh, because, you know, they, they exist on a valuation channel, right? So the first peak was in 1980 when, so in 1971, when they delinked um, gold from the dollar. Um, so gold had a fixed value which uh, is, it was completely artificial, right? Because you can never really fix the value of these things. It's, it's really determined on de supply and demand, right? You know, what the people want, right? What the people are willing to pay for. You know, it's not determined by any government bureaucrats behind closed doors. So once they delinked uh, this artificial $35 an ounce um, gold price, it just skyrocketed, okay? So it went from $35 an ounce in a matter of a few years to $800 an ounce, which is a massive, massive increase. And, um, <clears throat> and then after that, it, um, it decreased for various reasons, you could say, uh, you know, manipulation, uh, government manipulation, federal central bank interest rate rigging, all that kind of stuff, kind of fun stuff. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, so, so, so if you look back in history, you can see these cycles, 
Um, <clears throat> so gold and silver exist in what's called a valuation channel. Actually, you could say most commodities exist in a valuation channel, um, but gold and silver is, uh, they're special because they're considered money, right? And, uh, and so they're historically considered money. So, um, so you can see that when, when uh, the U.S. government, um, before 1913, right, which was when the Federal Reserve was created, um, it, was, it was a fix, $20 equaled um, one ounce of gold, $20 to one ounce of gold. And then, um, and then you had the, you know, the, um, so the Federal Reserve comes in, 1913, uh, signed by Wood President Woodrow Wilson, then immediately you have World War I the next year, right? Surprise, surprise. How do you pay for the war? You print a lot of money, right? Because you're not going to get the people to pay for the war through taxation, right? Because people are, they feel acutely when, um, when you raise taxes to fund some idiotic, um, self-serving, murderous war overseas, um, and they'll feel that and they're going to withdraw support. People don't want to be um, paying for, you know, the death of other people, other human beings. Most of the time, people just want to work and support their family and, you know, make sure the kids have a good education, make sure they have food on the table. <laughs> Not many people want to work to support a uh, bloody war, right? So, so the only way that they can pay for war, and this has been true time and time again in, in um, pretty much every empire, you know, the Roman Empire, right? The, the ancient um, uh, Greeks, you know, fighting in the Peloponnesian Wars. You have, you know, all these, all these um, vast imperialistic empires, um, every time they would engage in war, they would have to debase their currency. And they would have to do that various ways. In, in, in ancient Rome, it was, uh, they would clip the coins and they would, um, deba or they would debase, debase it by mixing it with base metals like copper and bronze. And, um, and so they would, you know, basically, um, <laughs> you know, they would take in, let's say, a thousand gold coins, and then they would spend two thousand gold coins, which obviously they didn't have. But uh, it's all, you know, it's and it's, it's all basically reflected in debt, right? It's basically debt that the citizens are uh, expected to pay back. So, so war, so so World War One, you know, um, instigated or or started this massive fiat currency creation, which. Um, uh, which led to the, you know, the Roaring Twenties and, you know, the, the supposed boom, right? And uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> so, so it's basically what it leads, it's basically what money printing does is it leads to an artificial stimulus in the economy um, as, you know, all this, in, all, all this introduced liquidity um, gets poured in and people make investments and people grow their businesses. And so people feel like, you know, they're a little bit wealthier. However, this is um, um, a pretty uh, deceptive feeling because uh you know it's basically it's basically you know when you're <clears throat> when you when you're doing uh let's say um you know i don't know drugs you you have morphine or any kind of heroin cocaine you know you you have a high right but of course you can't maintain that high and so eventually you have uh, a big crash right so so uh so the roaring 20s was basically the uh, the introduction or the preparation for the uh the crash of 29 and it was it was basically inevitable that it would happen. <clears throat> um, incidentally, also just um, just to mention this um, in Germany, where World War One was fought uh, for the most part, <clears throat> um, the German country was so so devastated by uh, all of the fighting and all of the destruction of prop private you know property and infrastructure and roads, bridges, all that stuff. Uh, so their economy was just destroyed. And then, uh, of course, since they were defeated, on top of that, you know, through the Treaty of Versailles, they had to pay war reparations. Which, uh, actually, uh, as a side note, um, I believe it was about thirty billion dollars that uh, thirty billion dollars that um, President Woodrow Wilson uh, borrowed from the Federal Reserve to pay for the war. And today, we are still paying that money back, right? Incidentally. I should mention that a little less than a century later. Um, actually, no, about a century now. Yeah, about a century now. <laughs> We're still paying that money back. So it's kind of fascinating, you know, when you get into the, the upside down, topsy-turvy world of debt and fiat currency creation. So, <clears throat> so um, in Germany, after the war was done, they were enslaved by all of this debt. Um, that Also, they had to print money as well to pay for their war, you know, for their war effort. But um, 
So they were, you know, after they, 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 were, they were defeated, the Treaty of Versailles was, was signed and they had to pay war reparations. That was the, uh, that's the agreement for any, most of the time, any country that is defeated in war must pay the war reparations to the, uh, the victor countries. And so um, I think just a few years ago, I think, I think like something like 2010, uh, the United States pardoned Germany. They said they don't have to pay the war reparations for World War I. We're still, they were still paying back the United States for World, World War I, right? So they were burdened down by the Treaty of Versailles. And in order to, so, so they, they had to basically lift themselves out of this pit of despair of, you know, destroyed infrastructure and, uh, and you know, and debt and um, the war reparations. And so there's really a, 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 a time there where they were very uh, hurting a lot. And, and, and this, this sort of um, uh, very eco economically um, poor uh, environment is what helps to breed the rise of dictators and tyrants, right? Because the people are clamoring for their political masters to lead them out of this um, pit of despair, right? This um, this turmoil. So, so this was a perfect uh, backdrop for the rise of Hitler and the Third Reich. And so, and of course, when he came to power, he was, um, you know, hailed as a hero. You know, his speeches were were like highly praised. And he said, "I'm going to, you know, lift out." Germany from this pit and I'm going to make it the envy of the world you know we're going to be the technological marvel of the world things like that uh, of course he didn't, he didn't say that he was going to kill millions of people and gas them right because uh, he most likely wouldn't have been given the seat of power if you had right which basically goes for any every tyrant in history right N none of them uh, when they're campaigning ever say that they're going to kill millions of people because um, people generally don't like that <laughs> so he of course gave them all the typical pol political rhetoric that uh, politicians like uh, know that people want to hear in order for them to get elected, right? So, so he basically um, and, and their their situation, their their strategy for trying to get themselves out of this pit of economic despair is the same. It was the same um, strategy that we're using today, exactly the same. And what is that strategy? Print money. All right currency creation they lit up the printing presses like you wouldn't believe and um, although there have been several hyperinflations in history uh, the German Weimar Republic hyperinflation of 1924 was fascinating uh, and and it, it became one of the um, one of the famous examples of, of hyperinflation in history um, because you had and it was and it was basically you know it was, it was really like, you know, carrying wheelbarrows of money to buy a loaf of bread, right, or, or, or a dozen eggs. Um, at the beginning of the hyperinflation, I think around 19, we'll say 1919 or 1920, um, the, the convertibility of the German uh, mark to gold was, I think, like 100 marks, German marks, equals one ounce of gold, 100, right? Five years later, 1924, after all of this massive currency creation money printing, they had destroyed the value of their currency so much that right before the collapse, it took, in order to buy one ounce of gold, you had, you needed 100 trillion German marks. Okay, <laughs> now just imagine, imagine the amount of money printing they had to do to achieve that. It, it, was, it was simply amazing. Um, and basically what that signifies is that process of money printing, what it actually does to a, to a society is it siphons wealth from the productive class, right? I mean, I mean you think that um, it would be a good thing, right? Printing money. You know, we always need more money, right? Maybe, maybe we just print some. That'll solve the problem. But, uh, but again, we have to go back to the idea that wealth is not created from the politicians nor from the central bankers, right? Wealth is only created from the, from the productive middle class, from the, from the industrious people, right? From the entrepreneurs, the innovators, right? The creators. So these are the people that create wealth, not printing uh, a bunch of pieces of paper with uh, pictures of dead people on it, and calling that money and you know putting some ink on it 
that does nothing, okay? So all it does basically is steal through what's called the hidden tax of inflation, steal everyone's, or basically specifically the middle class, steals the middle class wealth, right? And so, so basically the effect of, um, of this printing of inflation and, and eventually consequently hyperinflation is that it destroys and completely wipes out the middle class completely, all right? Um, and, and, and also enriches the elite, right? Those who are, you know, the politicians and the, uh, the cronies, people who are politically connected, as well as the central bankers that actually control the uh, monetary supply and uh, print the money, right? So the poor see no change, basically, they, they're still poor, but the middle class, which is basically the health of a country, the middle class is completely wiped out, right? So this is called a wealth transfer. So it's, it's, it's wealth that's transferred from the industrious who produce the wealth to the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the sociopaths in power, the, the politicians and the central bankers who have done absolutely nothing to deserve or to um, earn that wealth, right? So uh, this is the supreme crime of um, currency creation or also called the Mandrake Mechanism, named after a magician in the 1940s. Um, Mandrake the magician, he had the, um, the ability to make things appear and disappear at will, right? So, which is basically what um, printing money is, is basically printing money out of thin air, just like a magician, right? And, and where does that money get its value? It steals it from the existing currency in supply, right? And, you know, that's the slow whittling away of your money, of your currency. Um, so, so, yeah, and, and towards the end of the hyperinflation, the Weimar hyperinflation, um, you had people using the money for wallpaper. <laughs> you had people burning it for its heat because that was pretty much the only value that it had left. It had no monetary value whatsoever. And, and just to give you an idea of how important precious metals is in a situation like that, um, at the end of the, the Weimar hyperinflation in 1924, right before the collapse occurred, or the, the wealth transfer occurred, gold, um, it was, I think it was about 25 ounces of gold was able to purchase one block of commercial real estate in Germany, in the Weimar Republic. One block of commercial real estate. Now think about that for a minute. Now think about how much, how much does one block of real estate in Manhattan cost? How much would that cost? <laughs> and if you calculate that, I, I did a rough calculation um, about, let's say, we can assume maybe $20 million, right, for one block of commercial real estate in Manhattan. How much would that be for 25 ounces of gold? If you divide 25 into that, I think it was roughly around $800,000. $800,000 value of gold to purchase one block of commercial real estate. So you can, you, you can imagine the value that precious metals must attain to do an accounting for all of that excess paper that was printed. You know, the, it, it has to even out, right? The, the distortions that, that printing money, printing currency creates is just simply massive. And, and you just cannot ignore the economics when at the end of all that, gold and silver being something that is physical, tangible, and unable to be printed at a whim by, by uh, central bankers, um, when it does an accounting for all of that excess money and, uh, and credit. So it's, it's simply an amazing process. And, and once you begin to study monetary history, you, you begin to understand many patterns and cycles. And, and that's the thing that we have to realize that um, these cycles exist and if we can take advantage of these cycles you can prosper you can you can benefit amazingly you really can um, you have to be cognizant of them and you have to recognize and respect them okay because to think that you that, that you can uh, achieve success and be ignorant in economics or monetary history is <laughs> one of the saddest tragedies and follies that I have come to realize how difficult it is to uh, to succeed in any kind of business 
when you're ignorant in um, in the banking system, ignorant in economics, and ignorant in monetary history. It's just um, it's just one of the one of the necessities that that we must learn that has not been taught to us in any respect in um, in our government schools, and I think that's for good reason because if we were all um, knowledgeable and capable people, we would be um, in a different place today. <laughs> All right, well, that's the time I have today. So uh, thank you very much for listening. This is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Um, wishing all of you uh, have a great day. Take care. Bye.